Lusitania was built in 1906. She was built by Cunard and she was built under the supervision of the Admiralty. Um, she was the biggest ship that was ever built and she was built basically to win back the Blue Ribbons, which the Germans had hailed since the 1890s. On her final journey, which was from New York to Liverpool, um, she had already crossed the Atlantic 202 times. Um, she left um, and she was loaded on the 29th of April. She was uh, being loaded with, um, with stores, um, some food, copper, brass, all this kind of stuff. And during the night, she was secretly loaded with ammunition. But before the ship left New York, the captain shut down boiler number, boiler room number four, which reduced the speed of the Lusitania down to 19 knots. People asked him about this, but they said that the captain assured them that Lusitania was the fastest ship in the world. She could do up to 25 knots. A U-boat can only do 10 to 12 knots. That there was no way they were quite safe that if a U-boat came round, they would um, overrun the U-boat. The captain didn't zigzag like he was supposed to. He was warned to stay away from the land, but he didn't either. He decided to head in towards land. The reason for this, he said, he lost his bearings in the fog and he wanted to get his bearings back. And he saw the old King sail and he decided. By doing so, U-boat 20 was on our way back, our way back to Germany. Put up his periscope and saw the ship in the distance. The ship turned 13 degrees and he turned right into his path. He decided to chase down the, the, the ship and she was at 90 degrees to him and 700 yards he fired one torpedo which the captain claimed hit between the third and fourth funnels and the uh, engine blew up, the engine stopped. Like I said, the captain was below deck, he wasn't on the bridge, and when the torpedo hit, he got to the bridge. He was, he said to hit between the third and fourth funnels, and it was a second explosion then in the bow, under the bridge, on the starboard side. Um, straight away, when the torpedo hit, the ship started to list, okay? and. All the lifeboats that were on the port side couldn't be launched, only two of them were launched. The other lifeboats actually swung out. Once the ship had over a list of 25 degrees, they couldn't get into the lifeboats because the lifeboats were after swinging out. They were jumping from, but most of them missed them and landed in the water. There was only six lifeboats land, launched off of the Lusitania. Um, she went down in 20 minutes. She was gone by 20 past two. And the captain stayed on the bridge, but was actually washed off of the bridge. Okay guys, we're now uh, standing out in Kennedy Pier and uh, the reason I brought you out here is today is to show you a photograph that was taken here in 1915. And in this photograph it shows uh, the lifeboats of the Lusitania bringing in uh, the dead and the survivors. And uh, this photograph was taken exactly on the spot where we stand today. Uh, this photograph shows uh, the lifeboats and some kids playing in the lifeboats having some fun. Again, the innocence shown that no one of the kids really realised the tragedy that was actually unfolding as the bodies and survivors were coming on shore here in Cove. Uh, over to my left hand side here also would have been uh, the building behind this building you see here would have been the Cunard office. This was the head office of the Cunard and this would have been where a lot of activity happened to. Unfortunately a lot of the coffins that had to come here for the dead would have been brought onto this pier over here and um, Captain Turner of Lusitania actually was said to have stayed in one of these offices as the backlash and the anger in the town as they found out that the Germans had U-boated and torpedoed the Lusitania. Also here in Cove, we had a German who owned the Queen's Hotel, and uh, even though he brought many of the survivors in and helped them, the reaction of him being German um, prompted the people in Cove uh, to have um, a lot of anger. And uh, that man had to hide in the wine cellar, and later on, as the days went by, he actually packed up his business here and uh, moved away. That gives you some sense of the anger that actually was around this town when people found out actually what happened to the RMS Lusitania. Uh, hi, my name's Joe Wynn. Um, I'm over here in Cove uh, regarding some of my family history with the ship, the Lusitania. Um, two members of my family were on board the Lusitania, my great-grandfather uh, and his son, my great-uncle George, who was only 16. George was on this ship first. He'd done quite a few journeys to New York and back, and his father was out of work. Uh, originally, uh, his mother didn't want his father to go, but because they were together, she was happy. Uh, and it was his first trip to New York and back, and on the way back, 
uh, the ship was torpedoed uh, off the head of Kinsale and many of the survivors were brought into Cove. When the ship was torpedoed, he went to find his dad and he met on deck and George didn't have a life belt so his dad gave him his and his dad went down to find another one in the cabin, the glory hole they called it. And that was the last George ever seen of his dad, never seen him again. Um, George couldn't swim and in the water he was eventually knocked unconscious and somebody tied him to some wreckage with a bit of rope and he was rescued and he arrived here and he was running all up and down the harbour trying to find his, his dad um, and after a couple of days it was obviously you know they never ever found him so you know, he never found his father he then they, they were all allowed one tele, telegraph back to home to Liverpool and at the time he was 16 you've got to remember and he just sent it, his, his telegraph said uh, both saved to his mother um, and then by the time he arrived in Liverpool on the train he got off the train and his mother was standing there with the youngest one in her arms waiting for him and his father and he couldn't face her and he ran dodged everybody and he ran over to one of the big buildings in Liverpool called St George's Hall where the local parish priest was obviously there looking for people and he seen George he recognised him and George poured out the story to him and him and the parish priest went and told his mother about, the, about the, his dad and that's how she discovered that uh, her husband had died uh, and this guy here knows more stories about the families than anybody uh, that you could possibly wish to meet well there's there was 1,956 known uh, passengers and crew on the Lusitania. Of those, 1,198 were lost. So when you think back on this, on the 7th of May 1915, there was between six and 700 survivors in all conditions landing here in Cove. Accommodation had to be found for them, medical attention, food, and like that, uh, telegrams sent home. Um, mortuaries to be set up here to try and um, cater for the dead and identify the dead. Uh, for a number of days here in, in, in Cove, um, their world was, was, was totally changed. Uh, they had survivors um, all over the place trying to get accommodation everywhere. They also had in the region of 170 uh, bodies to, to cater for. On Monday the 10th of May, most of the, the, the bodies were interred above in the old church cemetery outside the town here in three mass graves and there's a number of private um, personal graves as well. The minute the disaster was heard about, th there was three mass graves dug. They were dug by the 44 rifles, 60 men dug the graves. It was very, very hot, I believe, when they started digging the graves. And uh, the more bodies that came in, it started off with one grave, the more bodies that came in, they started to dig another grave. So there was an hon another 100 men were brought in to dig the graves. There's also um, 18 private graves um, outside here. Some are unmarked, some are marked. Um, and like I say, um, people still come to visit, visit the graves and um, every year there's nearly a memorial held. Uh, I want to show you this grave here. It's the grave of Alfred Willerby. And as you can see by the gravestone, this guy was only four years old. He was the last person to be buried in the cemetery. I've been told that he was one of the last bodies found and that the crew that found him were actually buried him, who paid for the grave and buried him. He's only four years of age. And as you can see by the headstone, the that it says, uh, murdered, a uh, victim of the Lusitania, uh, murdered by Germany. That's what it says on the, the headstone. So this is the last actual uh, grave in the cemetery for the Lusitania. To talk about some of the people on the Lusitania when it sank, the highest profile was Alfred Gwyn Vanderbilt, who was a multimillionaire from America and allegedly reputed to be the, the richest man in the world at that time. He became a hero of the Lusitania because he was seen on deck handing out life belts, uh, assisting women and children uh, in securing life belts and giving away his own life belt despite the fact that he was known not to be able to swim. He was counted among the last of the Lusitania, his remains were never found and he's just one of the many that are still out there. Hi, welcome to Cove Museum. Because yeah, I forgot to say it, you need to go one, two, three, go. Don't just go, go. I want to be saying hello, welcome to go. Okay, hello. No, 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 we'll all do it together. Yeah. Cunard left Cove 
their uh, crest, this crest, was stored in the basement of what is now the White Star Line building. And it stayed there for a number of years and got very rusty and it was not in very good condition and was donated to the museum when the museum opened in 1973. And uh, Cove Museum in Titanic year uh, decided that they would have the crest restored. So there was a big conservation do job done on the crest. It's actually always been in our porch, but it's been restored over the last couple of years. And they've actually done quite a nice job. When we had it, it was so rusty, we didn't realize there were colors on it. But now you can see the kind of the golds and the reds and the blues. So it's really quite a nice piece of work. OK, I'm going to show you some of the things that we're probably going to include in our exhibition in the museum next year. We're going to look at the role of the Lusitania. We're hoping to look at the search and rescue mission, so the people going out to help bring back the, 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 the live and the dead. One of the items we've recovered from, or we've been donated from the Lusitania is a deck chair. We're not 100% certain it's from the Lusitania, but the likelihood is that it, that it was from there. It was washed up close to the old head of Kinsale, uh, and there would have been bodies washed up in the same area. Uh, so it's very likely that this deck chair came from the Lusitania. We also have a very large timber hatch, which is also likely to have come from the Lusitania, was washed up on Court McSherry Beach, and we know that there were bodies washed up there as well. So a couple of these items will be on display next year. So they're really quite unique because it's very, very difficult to get artefacts from the Lusitania. The Lusitania is 11 miles out to sea. There are all sorts of restrictions on diving, and uh, it's very, very difficult to, to get artefacts from the actual Lusitania. So items like these that might have been washed up are actually quite interesting and precious, and we're very lucky to have them. Some of the things that we have here, which we do, do know are directly connected with the Lusitania, are two pipes uh, that belong to a guy called Captain Brierley. Captain Brierley was the captain of the Flying Fish, which was an Admiralty tug. There were three, I think, Admiralty tugs that went out to the rescue of the Lusitania. So they, they would have been in the care of the, the British government, if you like. Uh, he was the captain of one of the ships, and we actually have an image, I'm not quite sure how well you can see it, of, of several of these tugs in, in Queenstown. And this one here is the Flying Fish, which he, it was the ship he was the captain of. Um, he, they were one of the first tugs to, to, to reach the Lusitania and to be part of the search and rescue mission. So they're rather a nice thing to have. Another thing Cove Museum has, uh, which are originals, are telegrams, uh, which came, were, were sent from Cove, or Queenstown, it was, as it was known at the time, uh, they mostly relate to what was happening after the, the victims were brought in. And so they're telegrams to and from family members describing whether or not these people were, were um, alive or dead or what might happen in the future. This relates to somebody who actually survived uh, to Miss E.A. Day, or Miss E.A. Day, reported saved, Cunard. So it's a telegram from Cunard to the family telling them that their family member had survived. So they're quite poignant in their own way. And what happened next to the town then was that the Cove people, which was Queenstown back then, were very, very um, good towards the, the survivors and the people that came off the Lusitania. So back then when people came into the town on survivors on the Lusitania uh, lifeboats and the flying fish and so on, the people of the town gave them clothes, they gave them food, and it was all put on tick, as we call it back then. But when the companies and the, the, the people involved came back to the shops to pay for that, the people in Cove said, look, we don't want any money for that. It's, um, it's a tragedy. So, I mean, it's often noted that, and it should be noted that, the people of Cove done very great work for um, their, uh, what happened with that tragedy of Lusitania.